just so that is, is the mess we're in now is the product of, of decades of sort of misplaced priorities, federal focus, uh, geared towards middle of the road voters in terms of the orientation of the Demo Democratic Party, um, and, and national networks and national activity always geared towards uh, the next great thing or the next bill that's just about to pass but just doesn't quite make it. And so I would, you know, we got the state power caucus and, and in Virginia, we take a look at um, long term state nationwide. There's 40 million people that is really are broadly everybody on this call sort of social base. Uh, majority people of color, younger folks, often uh, either disenfranchised by laws or in practice. Uh, and, and our sense is it's at 40 million that we need to figure out how to up our game, our organized game, so that, that you know, tens of millions of more folks are participating uh, in elections. And, and, and I think just having that sort of change gives the uh, gives a basis for, for talking about a different kind of politics. So that, that's one piece to it. A, a second piece we would look at is, is sort of the over-determined importance of, again, long-term strategy, drilling back into the state. Is, is that the federal power, the federal sort of uh, white nationalist majority that, that has been running, you know, running the presidency and beyond is, um, again, a product of, of, a, of, of essentially fixing the system, rigging the system, to use their language, rigging the system in terms of districts, uh, who can vote, who can't vote, uh, and then drawing the lo from the local to the state. And so if you always have a 20 or 30 or or more seat advantage at the national level, you can always run federal policy. So we would look back and say, what are the kind of united fronts, the united efforts that we can build with many of the organizations represented on this call at a state-by-state -state basis? And I would push another long-term sort of strategic sort of uh, goal should be figuring out how does sort of institutionalized organizing, and there's roughly 20 state organizations in the state power caucus, many like New Virginia majority or New Florida majority, uh, but how, how does structure or institutional organizing link up or work better with distributive organizing and a sort of new wave of uh, movement for Black Lives, Mi Gente, et cetera? How do we actually create more of those intersections and more porous relations? Because that's the only way we're going to get to the scale that, that I think we need. And then I think the other longer term thing, and again, this isn't directly asking or answering, do we borrow within the Democratic Party or what do we do there? But really, how do we create a not in an electoral sense, but a party-like structure where we can actually get groups of people who can agree on a strategy, can agree on a collective practice, can get together after they try to do that uh, practice for a while, sum it up, make some changes, and do it again. I, I think in the absence of that, in the absence of you know political instruments, I'm call it political party and others, but, but in the absence of some kind of political space, and I view this organizing upgrade call as even a step towards that, how do we create those spaces where I would argue both nationally but particularly state by state, where can we develop an approach that actually builds from the ground up and actually has a, a shared collective practice so we can have summaries and, 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 and adjust accordingly. Okay. Cool. So I think it's I've thought about this question about the short term, medium and long term, especially around the Democratic Party for the past few years. And I think that my conclusion is like, I think it's kind of sometimes the wrong frame to ask, um, not an incorrect, but I think we need to take a step back. And I think that none of the long short term, even if we're talking about coordination, our strategy actually change our talking about changing the rules, changing both how the party functions, changing how people are elected, um, which I think is something I do respect for Larry Cohen kind of brings up where he, he says like, why are people so not interested in this, even though it's boring, but inside baseball about how do you actually elect people in the who controls the Democratic Party, because it does affect how primaries are run. Um, the superdelegates is kind of the quintessential example, though it kind of can be exaggerated. So I think that if you aren't really talking about, and this is not something I work on day to day, so it's not a criticism of anyone, but if you're not really thinking about public financing or instant runoff voting or other reforms, you kind of are stuck with the, the status quo, which means that I think it's not, a, I've rejected realignment since I'm like 25 years old as actually something that's gonna happen. 
So I think it's like, you're not going to push out these corporate Democrats in mass. They're not, not everyone wants to be a Republican. Um, and if there's not going to be a third party for the moderates, for the far right, in the end, what you're doing is I think, which is totally fine, is you're fighting for the progressives to be the dominant faction of the Democratic Party, not the exclusive faction. So it's like kind of where I reject and Trotsky's view of the world that, you know, you can just enter in and then suddenly everything will be, you know, one perfect line. You know, I don't think that. I think it's like there will continue to be class struggle through the Democratic Party, but you could have a party where the majority of members are, in the Congress are members of the Progressive Caucus, uh, where there is, where the Democratic Party agenda is not only progressive on paper, but is something they follow through with. With that, it's, it's, I don't think it's going to happen with absent serious changes to how the party is structured in electoral law, um, that there won't be corporate Democrats, there won't be blue dog Democrats. It's just, it's just all part of a two party system. So that's kind of always been my two cents. And I think like what we're all doing is really important. And I think that but sometimes I don't, I get where I, I'm not interested in questions about dirty break or not. That's just my two cents. In, in terms of our policy agenda, I do think focusing on structural reforms of both the economy and our democracy is where I think it makes the most sense for us to coalesce. Whatever our particular issue focus, when we have opportunities um, to either through executive power, where we have progressives or le leftists with executive power on the local, statewide, or, or national um, level, or where we have legislative power, number one, our agenda has to be transforming the structures of our economy and our democracy. And I think the right wing is very good at having that level of focus around changing the structures because, you know, essentially almost every single thing that they do, when you think through the prism of, does this weaken the ability of working class people to uh, engage in our democracy, either workers' democracy through having strong workers' organizations and grassroots organizations and unions, or through um, the practical sort of um, tools of our democracy through the ballot, um, all of these reforms that the right wing are pushing dilutes our power and locks in their power. And we need to have this, a similar sort of power analysis towards what are the, what are the reforms and structural reforms that we're advancing that uh, advance the power broadly of, of working people and dilute and constrain the power of organized capital. Um, and I think one, and then the other thing is the two party duopoly, we need to aggressively, even in the short term, begin to engage in a popular conversation around the fact that it limits the ability of, of everyday people and working people and people with minority political opinions to be able to advance their agenda. And we need to expand, um, we need to expand the parameters of it through fusion, rank choice, rank choice with multi-member districts, and then, you know, discuss other things like the, the um, electoral college and the Senate and other, other structures that are fundamentally anti-democratic and begin to engage in the cultural battle in order for people to understand these things that some people just accept as being sort of part of like common sense of, of what it means to be, what our democracy needs to look like and, and begin to kind of um, uh, challenge these institutions, right? So I, I think that that's critical that, and that could happen on the short term, long term and then intermediate level, there's different tactics that could allow for that to happen. Um, but yeah, we need to expect, like, I'm, I'm clearly, I clearly, I'm building a political party. So I'm looking towards a long term end where, where third parties actually could get over the spoiler sort of a conundrum and folks could, could in mass be able to vote their conscience without, um, you know, engaging in spoiler activity. And the duopoly, the two party duopoly kind of prevents that. In the short term, we're going to use the Democratic primary as a, as a site of struggle, um, because that's that's the terrain that we, we could operate under. But in the long term, we have to expand the terrain. Um, you know, so I think for us within our statewide alignment group, when we were setting our long term vision and what we call our North Star, it was really around breaking the back of Jim Crow and asserting non patriarchal governing power. Um, and then to start to map out what does it look like to expand democracy 
to end the criminalization of communities of color and young people and build community wealth. And I think one of the things that we found on that journey is like the, um, just the importance of creating that space um, to really engage in that radical imagining and visioning together and how often we shortchange that process. Um, and I think in the, you know, in the, just to kind of point to two examples, like really concrete examples to ground that is, um, you know, in crisis, there's opportunity. And I think when we're, when we don't have um, those kinds of roadmaps, um, there are oftentimes opportunities that we miss. Um, so whether that's like the, the work of um, people to be um, inside, you know, inside the Democratic Party so that, um, you know, positioned in such a way that, you know, in the in the last cycle, we got the Florida Democratic Party to agree to not take private prison money. Um, and then that spread to California and to other um, and to other places. But, you know, I think that it requires a certain amount of um, foresight and making sure that people are positioned to move things like that. And then I think the second example I wanted to point to is just the, you know, in this moment of, you know, for us, having had a trifecta in the state where Republicans had controlled this, both houses of the state legislature and the governor's mansion for so long um, to think about what it would be like to have somebody in the governor's mansion and what kinds of opportunities would open up really required us to go issue by issue um, and trying to like wildly churn out um, memos, like putting out what, what, what we would want to advance um, in, you know, in the first 90 days on everything from climate to criminalization to immigrant rights. Um, and I think the, you know, that exercise, I think really pushed us not only to, to really walk out what it is that we want, um, but also helps us create those kinds of roadmaps that then make, makes it more possible for you to take advantage of opportunities when they arise. Uh, yeah, so just two things that struck me uh, listening to folks. Um, one, you know, Beth uh, mentioned uh, unions and kind of employers. And, and I guess it just, uh, I feel like it's important to say on this call that if the labor movement in its current form is not transformed and revitalized, I think it's gonna be really hard to imagine, you know, kind of a, a left majoritarian governing coalition. Um, the way I think about it is that like, as long as the society is based in wage labor, that organized labor is gonna have a very unique and relatively independent a funding model, although as we often see, not as independent as we want. And so I, I just see two tasks, doing new organizing at work um, and also, you know, uh, electing progressive leadership within existing trade unions as being essential to having a, you know, kind of a well-funded, powerful um, kind of uh, governing coalition, electorally speaking. And then the second thing I just wanted to say, um, I guess my thought on what a kind of reasonable thing to say a long-term goal is, is that we want like a left intersectional hegemony within a majoritarian governing coalition. And so on this question of whether that happens exclusively through the Democratic Party after the Democratic Party fractures or as a result of electoral reforms that allow a multi-party system, I'm agnostic on that, but I think I am clear that we are looking for that, you know, kind of left intersectional hegemony inside of a majoritarian coalition that can really, you know, move like fundamental changes to this economy at the federal level. So I'll stop there. Thanks.